board meeting is being video and voice recorded and will be posted on the board's YouTube channel. So, smile. <laughs> All right, so we will begin with our opening prayer and we welcome Adriana Research, chaplaincy leader at Assumption Catholic Secondary School. That's okay. We're flexible. You're in Burlington. So. <laughs> Thank you. My apologies. reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what was said so numerous shall your descendants be. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. The word of the Lord. More and more I'm beginning to realize that when we are called to fast, that what we are being invited to is not as much an experience of going without as an experience of going within. The true fast is a self-emptying, a ridding of the body, mind, and heart of all the excess. It is an uncluttering, a freeing of the pathway to our inner self, to that place where we can encounter God at the deepest of levels. When we have embraced God's presence in our very being, we are ready to make the movement from within to without. It is a movement that leads us to act and be in the world as Christ, to be God's presence of love, mercy, and compassion to all we encounter knowing that God will be our guide, our strength, our sustenance. Thank you. 
you very much, Adriana. That was really lovely. Thank you. Adopted in camera, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you. Resolved that the Halton Catholic District School Board accept the recommendation of the ad hoc committee that staff be directed to prepare and issue a request for a proposal, RFP, to identify an executive search consultant service to assist the Board of Trustees with hiring a new Director of Education and Secretary of the Board. Further, uh, HR activity report. Jill Staples appointed as Curriculum Consultant Generalist effective September 1st, 2013 for a period of up to three years. Rachel Novrin appointed as Curriculum Consultant Generalist effective April 22nd, 2013 to June 30th, 2015. Clark McDougall appointed as Secondary Vice Principal effective April 2nd, 2013. In interim school administrative appointments, Aaron Sweeney Heard appointed as acting principal effective May 1st, 2013, and Vincent Monaco appointed as acting principal effective March 18th, 2013. Kelly Williams appointed as acting vice principal effective March 25th, 2013. We have the retirements of Irene Kopp, Nancy Henderson, Wayne Lucy, and Teresa McKenzie effective June 30th, 2013. And lastly, we have resignations of Suzanne Tomoroy, Marzena Wardazala, excuse me for the pronunciation, and Jennifer Zaza, effective August 31st, 2013. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I'll move on to the approval of the agenda. Can I have a mover, please? Thank you, Trustee Murray. A seconder, please. Thank you, Trustee Morrison. Any questions? No? All in favor? Thank you. Uh, declarations of conflict of interest, I do not believe there are any at this particular session. So we will now go into our presentations on 21st century learning environments. And <coughs> Superintendent Rossini, you will introduce your team, please. Thank, Thank you. you. and to be able to implement developmental assets and to really understand um, how this process can work to effectively change the school culture. I begin with the Corpus Christi prayer because it really does embody what we're trying to achieve at Corpus and that is that we are the body of Christ and that we do the work of Christ and that our students really understand that they are a blessing upon humanity and that we as the leaders in the building and the caring adults connect with our students and really foster that, that feeling of acceptance and love. 
that really tends to reduce the bullying and different things that go on in the hallways and it's quite helpful and all the assemblies and that they do organize the grade nine form that they mentioned for them here for the grade ten once they're selected to be mentors for the next year they'll be commissioned at the camp they will receive support around the district on how to do their mentoring the grade 
What what is an asset in this context? What is an asset? Yeah. Uh, there's 40 of them, and they are, I, I'm handy to like keep with all of them. But we have different ones. There's like support, there's um, honesty. if Erica could comment also on the asset question. Mm-hmm. Would you like to add anything to, to that, Erica? The assets, uh, certainly, yeah, there are um, the 40 assets. We actually right now collect assets on, on 20 of them, but they are things like um, having t- uh, personal notes in the underlying um, act, uh, mortgages so that you tend to know where you are when you're at home or you have to ask for loans before you go out. Mm-hmm. We tend to do things actually more specific, but we're also finding, and we were taught this too, So, Shay, I just want to congratulate you on the implementation of this program. I think it sounds absolutely fabulous. Um, tutoring has always been touched on in schools, but the social and social tutoring aspect and the, the mentoring and the pairing of grade 9s and 11s, I hope your enthusiasm catches on and runs through the board. That was my point exactly. I hope the plan is to put this into every high school that comes under our umbrella. I do want to uh, commend everyone on, on the work because I know it's, it's a lot to do that. I, I'm questioning, I guess at this point, how much time you think it would take to implement this right across the board because I see that Corpus Christi scored very well in the Fraser Institute where some of our other secondary schools didn't fare quite so well. But uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm thinking this has to contribute to the overall success of the school. So I'm thinking the sooner we can get it into the other schools, the better. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, first, for sake of clarity, the Fraser Report, which would be a snapshot of a point in time, would have been a snapshot at Corpus Christi prior to the introduction of this program, and, and so would have no bearing one way or the other. Uh, the, uh, the broader uh, contemplation of developmental assets has been identified as a board priority, and we have been at work uh, at that business for about 18 months. Um, We not only uh, track the use of developmental uh, assets um, through our our data gathering mechanisms, uh, but we do so at all all ages. So so the very same kinds of uh, discussions about developmental (laughs) assets applied in this context to grade nine students making the transition into a secondary school um, serve as the the basis of comparable kinds of discussions uh, for JK and SK aged uh, students coming into the school system. And and in fact, developmental assets are a significantly reliable predictor of things like academic uh, performance. Uh, Developmental assets was the topic or the focus of a board-wide professional development day. That was the topic which we began the, uh, the, the work this year. And so while it looks somewhat different in each of our schools because we have encouraged our schools to, uh, to take the, the model, um, to digest it and to apply it within their own context in a way which is meaningful, uh, we are already well advanced in terms of uh, implementing the work related to developmental assets across the system. Thank you, Madam Chair. My, my comments were the same as the director's, but I will add that there is an additional opportunity for schools coming up on May 1st where uh, schools can send a lead around developmental assets to do some further work in training and development. I may ask, where will that uh, development and training take place? Erica, she's planning that for us. Oh. 
when you, the, if you look at the boundaries and expectations, um, and the family has rules and so on, do you notice any difference in students who are in a two-parent home versus a single-parent home? Um, do they have you know, different problems? I'm sure they do have different problems. And then also on the, um, well, neighborhood boundaries, neighbors taking responsibility. Well, most of the neighbors aren't home much during the day anyway. But it, does this also go out to um, the parishes, like through the deanery, um, that maybe the students, if, if, the, if the parish priests knew of the, this asset program that we're doing, would they be better off, better to uh, be open to approach from any of the students? Like, would that be a help as well? not gone to the, the deanery per se. Um, uh, it's important to understand that, um, that the work with developmental assets, which again is a, a conceptual framework or an approach other than a, uh, than a program, um, is also one that um, is being advanced through our ongoing partnership with the Our Kids Network. Um, and so it is, the, um, it is parallel language and approach uh, to those that would be increasingly adopted by many of the social services um, across the Halton communities, the, um, the, the municipal staff, the uh, uh, Children's Aid Society, um, hospitals, um, mental health facilities, and, and, and so there is a, a growing awareness and understanding of developmental assets. Uh, we have not to this point uh, extended an opportunity to learn about it to the deanery, but we'll take that under advisement. informative presentation on a really crucial area so thank you for all your work and please pass our appreciation on to all staff involved thank you thank you very much a recent document by the Council of Ministers of Education of Canada titled uh, Future Kent um, did talk to uh, the importance of building resilience in our children uh, as a way of helping them uh, better meet those challenges and so that is why we included uh, this presentation today for you in the context of 21st century learning environments. The second presentation illustrates one of the strategies that we're using to build teacher capacity in the use of technology, and that is the Collaborative Inquiry Innovation Project. So why did we choose this strategy? Ministry of Education is very much promoting the use of collaborative inquiry as a research framework in developing some very deep understanding about teacher capacity and instructional practice. Currently, uh, the ministry works with school boards around um, the collaborative inquiries for full-day kindergarten. There are some happening in full-day kindergarten. There's some happening in mathematics. There's some happening in uh, student work samples. And so we chose this approach because it was already familiar to educators. And we know that when teachers engage in research, in particular collaborative inquiry, there's very deep learning that occurs around pedagogy. So Stephen Katz, uh, an author, a very well-known author around education change, writes about inquiry as a means of keeping teachers focused on student learning. And so rather than implementing a mile wide and an inch deep, he speaks about collaborative inquiry really being digging down a mile and an inch wide. But you have to make sure when you dig down with inquiry that mile that it's the right mile that you're looking at. So collaborative inquiry is very much dependent on asking the right question, get collecting very good evidence around student performance, and using the right pedagogy to match them both. So collaborative inquiry at the heart is really going that mile deep that I just mentioned about. 
So we used collaborative inquiry and then we put out an all call for proposals on around the issue of technology, pedagogy being the driver, technology being the accelerator. And we really focused on the applications that spoke to us around teachers who were early adopters of technology. Because the research suggests that teachers who are early adopters of a technology are more likely to adopt technology even more in their practice if they're given that opportunity. So those early adopters of technology like to do research, they're proponents of change, they're visionaries around their practice in the, in the classroom, they're project oriented, and in fact they're a little easier to convince around innovation. And so we were hoping by harnessing the teachers who are early adopters that they would provide that influence for those teachers who are leading adopters. And I spoke a little bit in one of the reports that I, uh, that I uh, developed for you tonight around the Rogers Innovation Curve, and, and Mary Ann will, will talk a little bit more about that. But it's really important that we're very specific about how we approach technology and who we really want to harness that energy of and from in order to move it forward in our board. So the research department is actually looking at this, our own inquiry into inquiry and early adoption, and they're, they're going to determine for us about the process and the outcome of our collaborative uh, inquiries to inform us around this model for change. So tonight I, really, I want to welcome uh, Mary Ann Salvo, who's an itinerant special ed resource teacher with um, exceptional talent in the use of technology and technology in general. And she is really the person that is, uh, that is moving these um, collaborative inquiries that we're working with in this cohort. And one collaborative inquiry is engaged. Uh, we've invited Elizabeth McIntyre, who's the principal, and she'll speak to you a little bit of, this, of her own specific inquiry. And I think there's just one back here that I'd like to see. Uh, which one is over here?
when they will share their knowledge and help to spread the news and bring the evidence on board. And that's what has happened at this point because they are modeling these behaviors that we want all people to watch. So Michael Fuller, one of my heroes, basically what he says is that what we need to do is that we can be creative under the right conditions. So how do we set up? And Joshi spoke of this, this 21st century learning environment. How do we set up those conditions for collaboration, creativity, and innovation, critical thinking, and problem solving? So this is one of our schools, and they're grade three students. And basically, their collaborative inquiry was, how can we use the iPads in the three-part literacy lesson to increase student achievement and learning? And basically, their target was boys in grade two and all of the first grade. So not just like writing the script, but how can we communicate with other high school students in terms of different classroom paper? And how can we demonstrate their learning in other formats? So basically, just to give you the background, this is a pit stop animation. So they wrote the script and the different activities. So they had to, this is project-based learning. So even though to do this, it took them a long time, okay? So basically, they all had the different scenes of an activity sheet, and they had to actually reenact it through stop-motion animation. And for their minds on, I showed them the drawing on the board. They learned the process of how they could do that. And these are grade three students, so it's really good age. So what we need to do is we really have to see where their interest lies, where are their passions. We hear a lot about passion-based learning, project-based learning, problem-based learning. So we need to know, we have to ignite that fire and basically harness their skills. So what are the skills that they're using outside of the classroom, and how can we bring them inside of the classroom? So what's really important is we have to look at their peer culture. So how do we communicate with their peers, and can we use that type of technology within the classroom? So this is another one of our schools, and their collaborative inquiry is how can we raise the level of student 
question of where these skills can be used for these students. And um, so it has to be meaningful for them. So we all have a moral imperative. We all start off thinking about that precious student who we could make into our lives. And we have to think about, okay, class of 2020, so what are the skills that this child is going to need in order um, to be, um, to meet the demands of an unforeseeable future in a global economy? So what are these skills and how can we leverage these tools in order that they master these skills? So this is another one of our collaborative inquiries. Um, one of the uh, unique features of the iPad is that it, allow, it allows for precise learning. So that student, that specific skill, you can center on it if you are discerning in terms of selecting the right app that will, you can integrate and how you can transform the learning to a whole new level. So. Um, this child is getting one-to-one uh, -one instruction. So in terms of this project, it's Library to Learning Commons. So the students can access um, uh, electronic resources through their iPads, whether it be electronic books, um, and these periodicals and so forth, and also basically learn how to present their information in a different way. So they're actually signing out the iPad in the Learning Commons. And what happens is the Learning Commons gives them that flexibility that they can collaborate, that they can learn, um, and um, benefit from each other's understanding in a much more deeper and meaningful way. to the I generation and it should be changed to the we generation. But in terms of <coughs> what we're trying to do is inspire creativity, innovation, collaboration, critical thinking, and problem solving. We have to make our students be able to um, actually use these higher order thinking skills because uh, we can't focus on these problems anymore. So it's a shift. It's a shift in terms of also, uh, us as teachers, we, we have to actually be the ones that are in charge of in terms of the pedagogy and the content and knowledge, and we're learning together in terms of the technology to achieve this work for free. So I always hear the iPad is magical, and um, and I love my iPad, but. The magic really lies in the hearts of our students and our teachers that are actually showing them the different ways that they can harness the tool. So um, we're talking about accelerating the learning for our students and I'm going to invite Elizabeth and it's been an actual privilege working with her in her school on Math Media <coughs> Mondays and she's going to explain how we've been uh, very precise <coughs> in terms of the collaborative inquiry model to help these students. Thanks. Um, first of all, thank you very much for allowing me the time to, to share this. Um, we're, we've been on a journey, and I'm just going to give you a little snapshot. Can you hear it? Sorry. Oh, you can. Okay, we've been on, on a journey, and um, it all started with the proposal that we were allowed to hand in, and we were absolutely delighted that our proposal was accepted, and we had eight iPads arrive at the school. Well, we were so excited about these eight iPads, but what are we going to do now? So we get these eight iPads, and we have this great inquiry-based question that we're going to use, but we still don't know what we're going to do. And lo and behold, our guardian angel arrives, Mary Ann Salvo. <laughs> and I have to tell you, it was like divine intervention. She showed up, and it was just incredible what we set up for our teachers and for our students. So what happened was we started off with something called iPad Cafes. We had to make it inviting 
because Mary Ann had recognized that our staff were at different parts in the continuum. You had people who had their own iPad. You had people who just, you know, knew that there's an app for that. You had people, so we were all over the place. But Mary Ann recognized that, and she realized that we had to go with the model where you start with the people who can motivate everybody else. So we started off with iPad cafes where we invited teachers in, and we had them just use the iPads to look at what's going on and what do you have here. Mary Ann introduced some apps, and it got them really excited. Then we went into co-planning, co-teaching, debriefing, and all of a sudden it was infectious because all of a sudden you saw some teachers going by that went, oh, you know, I guess I could try that. And it was wonderful to see what was happening. And when we had the lessons happening in the classrooms, we would have a smart board where there'd be a little group there, and then you had kids with the iPads. And to watch the learning that was happening with these students was absolutely phenomenal. You had kids who wouldn't say a word, wouldn't say boo in a regular classroom sometimes, and all of a sudden there they were engaged. They were sharing things because they all felt that they could do this. And it was just incredible to see that happening. And the nice part about all of this was that we were able to share this with our school council, and they were very supportive, and they were just, buy whatever you need. So lo and behold, we got another 20 iPads. And it's just incredible. We're just in the process of distributing them, making kits, and we're like an iPad frenzy. It's just absolutely wonderful to see what you can do. We have the Apps Gone, um, Apps Gone Wild, or no, Apps Gone Free, or what is that? Oh, anyway, when we're sharing, you hear people coming in, and they'll, they'll come in with a cursive writing app. Look at this, and, and the sharing that's happening. So I have to tell you, a, a big thank you goes out, first of all, to Suzanne, spearheading this, and Mary Ann. Uh, we couldn't have done it. She's been incredible. And the gradual release of responsibility that our teachers are now seeing is wonderful, too, because they're feeling confident, and you can see the movement on the continuum. So it's been an absolute fantastic thing. And then for our Pierogi Night, we're hoping to raise more money for more iPads. So <laughs> come to our Pierogi Night, because we're going to have more iPads. Anyway, thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you very much, ladies. When is the Pierogi Night? <laughs> <laughs> in April. Oh, good. Do, do please send me an email. So, any questions for the ladies? Alison? I think we need an iPad cafe for the trustees. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me? Well, maybe maybe we should set up one with, with that. Just have a, a question, and I know that you've said that the school council bought iPads for, for St. Gabriel's. Where do we stand, and maybe this has to go to senior staff, where do we stand with iPads in the schools? Uh, like, do do all the schools have a few, or there are they? Where are they? Uh, we thank you through you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have been increasingly uh, expanding the use of iPads across um, a variety of uh, of classroom situations. So, so the work with iPads began about two years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and at that point was on a very limited basis. We had two or three pilots, one in a, a secondary setting, one at St. Matthew's at the elementary school. Um, the, uh, the kind of enthusiasm and appetite that you were hearing uh, through the presentation this evening has been a very consistent experience across the, the system. Um, the last conversation that I had with Wayne Elsoff, I believe that the, um, that the count of board-owned iPads that, uh, or, or board or school supplied iPads that we have across the system um, is around 1,400 and it continues to, to grow. Um, and in addition to that, it is becoming increasingly common um, that individuals, both students and members of staff, bring their own tablets, whether iPads or, or Android uh, tablets, um, into the environment of uh, the classroom with them. And, and that's consistent with our emerging strategy around uh, encouraging a bring your own device um, approach to technology. And just just to follow up, when when the school councils buy the iPads and donate them to the schools, then does the service contract then go under the board service contract if they're donated to the school, or how does the servicing on the iPads work? Uh, t two things that. Um, the, the purchasing is all flowing through the, the board. It's coordinated um, uh, through our IT services department. Um, that ensures that we're in a position to support the implementation of it, both from a staff development and professional learning perspective, 
and from a, a technical perspective in terms of uh, ensuring that the appropriately robust infrastructure is, uh, is in place. It also allows us to maximize whatever benefit we can get from uh, bulk purchasing. Um, well, uh, well, Apple's business model is that they rarely, if ever, directly discount the cost of their, uh, mm -hmm. their hardware. Um, they have been very supportive of the board in terms of the professional development um, and expertise that they are, are lending to the board. Um, the equipment that we buy is typically under warranty um, and so that's facilitated through IT as well. Although our experience with the iPad uh, to this point over two, two years or two and a half years almost is that they are proving to be remarkably resilient. Um, we have very, very few issues with respect to, uh, to breakdown or, or uh, device failure. Chair, just a, a point of clarification. It's not that a school council would purchase iPads. Uh, we're talking about school-generated funds through fundraising, so it's sort of a collaborative decision um, based on um, a, you know, a collaborative decision between the school and the school council to purchase the iPads through, as the director has pointed out, the purchasing department. I'd also like to uh, point out that, and as we've seen, um, demonstrate it so nicely tonight that there's an importance of a purposeful use of an iPad and so our administrators have been doing a lot of work uh, with representatives from iPad, uh, from the, um, from Apple and also learning from one another so that the use of the iPads become purposeful because there's one thing about purchasing technology but it's really important that it is something that is useful in the classroom so uh, and it's a benefit. Just a, a couple points. Um, there are a couple lines in the presentation that really uh, that jumped out at me. The, the first is it's uh, the, the program is steeped in real life problem solving, uh, and, and the second, how uh, do we adapt to unforeseeable demands in the 21st century? Um, so those two two items kind of struck me, and and the reason why I, I guess my my I have two questions. The, the first question is, what are so the project looks great uh, on. The presentation and the, and the movies and the, but with so many new apps coming out that are are so constructive and can help with the uh, professional development with the with the, the the development of the student uh, with with practical skills they can use in jobs. What are we doing to integrate those new apps? Uh, in, in and I realize like it's an age factor as well, but but what are we doing with that? And this is an actual lesson we did with Math Me and Mendy with um, um, the grade three students. So, um, so one of the apps we've been using is uh, the Notebook app. So we can use it both on the smart board and on the iPad. So, and what we are doing is we're actually creating lessons that mimic uh, real life situations. So the app is making change but they have to learn the most efficient way of making change. Right. So when you're rating the app, and there's a whole, um, you can Google it, the SAMR model, but it was from Apple. I just didn't want to go right into the theory, even though I love my quotes, um, <laughs> is um, what you need to really do is um, you have to look at um, the skills. You don't look at the app, you look at the skills you want the child to master because the apps are changing. They're, there's like 700,000 apps. They're changing constantly. So what is that skill you want them to master and then you you actually create the lesson based on the skill. So um, so th this is the, the making, so we, this skill, in order to actually facilitate small group instruction, we had um, a smart board center, and that's what you saw in, in terms of the pictures, and we also had an iPad center. And, and then there's other apps that we use um, um, uh, in terms of graphing and so forth. So the students are actually, and these were grade two students, were asking each other questions, and um, so we had, uh, and creating uh, pictographs, and then analyzing the graphs. So these are skills that, um, that they're learning in grade two, but they can use uh, throughout their lives in terms of uh, uh, reading data. So in terms of, we don't focus on the app because the app changes. 
So um, a, a beautiful quote that I love is in a quote um, in architecture is that um, function, uh, sorry, form follows function. So function is the purpose. So what what is the skill you want the child to master? And then you find the form. And actually, at 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 uh, I always tell Liz they have uh, they have a hundred math apps right now. Yes, and and I can even <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. It's 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 constant. So do you? So that's it can make learning very precise. But it's choosing. Um, that's why you have to focus on the skill. So I hope that answers your question. I think that's to uh, follow up. Um, there are now hundreds of thousands of apps for, for, for the iPad alone, not to mention like Android. And I'm just wondering, um, at the, do you see um, students being more involved in, in, in pushing, and I, I know it's not about the app, but pushing uh, ways of learning or different uh, apps that they can use for learning uh, in this type of program in older grades where they can share it with, with other? Um, I do see, well, we've started like, a, in Moto, we've started collaboration. So I do see that, um, What's really interesting, so now it's like uh, lear learning is happening, it is happening 24-7 because they're, they're actually discussing topics that happen in the class, such as their speeches, such as persuasive writing. So um, they d I do see like in terms of, uh, it's interesting you're saying that, like iMovie, because the students saw how simple it was on the iPad and and like my background is I used to teach media art, so I used to use programs such as Premiere, Photoshop, and, and, and those are very robust programs. And when they can do the same thing by just clicking, um, it, it's amazing. Toontastic, we had a, another inquiry last year. Um, they, the students had to create, in terms of project-based learning, they had to create a script for Macbeth using either Puppet Pals or uh, Toontastic, and they had to choose which app best uh, could reflect their theme. So I think they're being more um, discerning in terms of choosing what, the, knowing what they need to do and choosing the right app to meet their needs. Um, just to quickly say something, uh, Emily's also going to touch on this in her, uh, uh, in our uh, Team Jesse update, but uh, um, Ontario Student Parent Educator Survey uh, came out, there was uh, a release for it, um, and one of the questions that's been asked uh, constantly throughout the years um, in these surveys is whether or not technology, as uh, students feel, uh, well, the question is uh, whether or not um, people feel that technology is being uh, successfully used um, in the classroom setting, um, and throughout the years there's been an um, upward trend in uh, students, parents, and educators saying that they feel that um, technology is being successfully used in their classrooms and I think programs like this um, and individuals uh, like you uh, really focus and really foster that kind of feeling of uh, technology based learning um, and it's just wonderful to see um, so and it's great to see that uh, you're teaching uh, students um, ways to use technology that they can continue to use um, not only well it's a great in grade three so they can use it um, not only through elementary, but into uh, high school and also uh, into their post-secondary. So it's wonderful to see. Any other questions? Well, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much, thank ladies. You. We're very informative, very exciting. Look forward to hearing some more from you and uh, hope that you'll come back and give us an update. Thank you. Thank you All right, so we are moving on. Uh, there are no delegations, so we have the approval of the minutes of March the 5th. Can I have a mover, please? Uh, thank you, Trustee Marson. A seconder, please. Uh, thank you, Trustee Rowe. And Mr. Pelfer, you, your name is beside this. Did you wish to say anything? Nope, okay. Uh, so it's on the table. Any questions or concerns with the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Thank you. Uh, business arising from the previous minutes, and I believe that is uh, pertaining solely to the copyright um, policy that is moving through the system right now. Uh, Trustee Marson, did you wish to say anything with regard to that? No? Any questions pertaining to that? <coughs> All right. Uh, action item, the school year calendar, uh, Superintendent Rolls. 
Yes, just as a follow-up to uh, to our last um, uh, meeting, uh, when the school calendar was presented as a staff report, and just once again that the amendments were made to the uh, uh, Ontario regulations for this year only that uh, requires school board to designate five mandatory professional activity days as allowing one day uh, discretionary PA day for a total of six PA days. That's only just in, a, in effect for this year and I presume it will go back to, the, to what we normally have in subsequent years. So just with that we've had um, three uh, unpaid days, leave days that are scheduled as PA days and they're indicated here as October 11th, 2013, December 20th, 2013, and March 7th, 2014. Uh, two PA days, uh, which when the committee met, uh, were uh, chosen for assessment and completion of report cards of the elementary uh, panel, and those days are January 31st and uh, June the, the uh, pardon me, and June the 6th, uh, the <coughs> elementary panel. Uh, one of those coincides with the secondary day, uh, which is the curriculum review or turnaround day, and we also have a, a secondary uh, a different secondary review day on June 20 on June the 27th. So um, uh, we we will be have we will be um, having the five mandatory days and we'll be using the one discretionary day as our uh, system faith day on November the 22nd. I'll be Thank happy you. to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. All right. This is an action item, so we need a mover and a seconder, please. Trustee Michael moving it. Trustee Rose seconded it. All in favor? Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to, to make a few points about the monitoring report. Would that be okay with you, Madam Chair? First off, thank Candace Rempel and Lisa Collimore, who were the researchers that helped put together this outcome monitoring report, and without their assistance um, and guidance, um, it, it would have been a really difficult thing to do. So thank you to Erica and her team for assisting us in doing that. Uh, a few points I'd like to make about the outcome monitoring report. I know you've heard a fair amount around collaborative inquiry innovation projects, but on the first page, I'll draw your attention to, again, um, presentation on resilience and how uh, students are reporting higher levels of resilience uh, uh, for both grade 7 and grade 10 on the Halton Youth Survey. And what you'll recognize in a number of the reports that we do bring forward this year um, is that the themes around resilience, the themes around adults and a caring, uh, mentors and a caring adult uh, are, are pretty consistent when we're talking about our mental health strategy and promoting mental health and well-being, and the presence of an adult or a mentor is really important to mitigate factors around mental health issues. You'll notice those themes around resilience and the caring adult uh, in our Safe and Accepting Schools Act. We're developing a positive and warm and caring environment at school uh, is, is really the precursor to um, solid uh, student achievement. So you'll notice those themes coming over and over again in a number of areas. Um, on the second page, there is a co or in the inside of the document uh, does report a little bit to um, what uh, Director uh, Poutler did mention around the fact that we have uh, a 13 to 1400 iPads in the system. There are in any given day eight to 9,000 devices that are uh, utilizing <laughs> our, our Wi-Fi and um, so you can see that there is a growing amount of interest and use around technological tools. Um, under what works, there is a quote that was included by Michael Pullen that I'd also like to draw your attention to in the book on, called Stratosphere, Integrating Technology, Pedagogy, and Change Knowledge. And he speaks to, um, uh, we have ad hoc innovative teachers but not many innovative schools and no innovative systems. And I'd like to um, develop uh, that confidence in you that I, I believe the collaborative inquiry and utilizing the research we know about early adopters 
and leveraging that research and harnessing the energy created by early adopters is really going to serve us well in influencing later adopters. Having said that, um, we're very much looking at the fact that um, the needs of the later adopter may require different types of structures and support and different emphasis on technology because the early adopters are really those who are opting into the use of technology. And the later adopters may need more of a collective collaborative support system to help them along the way when they encounter those difficulties in the use of technology. So I just wanted to point that out to you. And finally on the back page um, where we il illustrated the uh, strategies, um, I, I, I really wanted to point out the fact that it's a collective effort on parts of all departments in uh, the Halton Catholic District School Board. The IT department couldn't do it alone, human resources couldn't do it alone, and it really is collectively um, our, our, uh, our ability to uh, be coherent in moving the implementation of the blueprint forward. And at the bottom, um, I would be more than happy to uh, provide you with any further details on the programs and initiatives. And it doesn't look like we have any um, guests here. Um, there is a code to get into the Learning Commons website. And the Learning Commons website is filled with wonderful resources to support our educators and our administrators in moving their libraries towards Learning Commons. field trips 10.2 superintendent Tassari. Madam Chair there are four um, educational field trips before trustees for your information this evening if there are any questions I'd be happy to answer them. of what's been accomplished uh, for the school year 2012-2013. Um, the framework is familiar to you. You're familiar with the Catholic learning environment, curriculum, school staff, and community. And in fact, uh, in, in each area, there's a number of activities that are going on within the board. Just to point out finally that there's a very robust research agenda around the blueprint to evaluate the implementation of the plan with the results uh, informing staff of the adjustments to be made to the blueprint for the 2013-2014 school year. Thank you. Um, just, just one question. When, when you talk about the 21st <laughs> century learning and the Catholic curriculum and now, does, does that 
that go, is there information on this that goes to the school councils and the school council's chairs? Like, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to me that so few people understand how that Catholic aspect gets into the curriculum. So does, would there be a report that could go to the school councils at any time saying um, that, you know, like the curriculum comes from the ministry and then, and then the Catholic curriculum consortium takes it and, and they put the Catholic perspective on it? Like, like how, how would that work to get it out to the parents? I was going to say I'll ask uh, Superintendent Tassari to respond to that. We're doing a lot of work around um, the distinctiveness of Catholic education, one being Catholic curriculum, as you know from our FACE project. And so there's been several documents that have been created that look specifically at those four pillars of Catholic education, including uh, Catholic curriculum. So there's some been work done with our Catholic school councils, our CPIC committee, and also workshops held at our parent conference. Um, in fact, two uh, sessions were held, two workshops that were very well attended by parents around what um, is distinctive about Catholic education, especially around what Catholic curriculum looks like. So um, we continue to do that work. Um, we've also done those presentations with our principals, who in fact then um, were to be doing those kinds of presentations with their school councils in their own school communities as well. Um, the message, though, uh, needs to be continued. Um, it's something that we don't become complacent about because it's very important that um, people understand that it is through our curriculum um, that really makes the difference in a Catholic school, so that infusion of faith in every aspect of our curriculum. So I really appreciate the question. It's work that we will continue to do with our parents and our entire communities. Yeah, just, just a follow up to that, because like I know sometimes the Catholic Women's League, they will ask me at church, you know, like how does it get there? Like, do we have a presentation that we could do to say the Catholic Women's League? Thank you for that. Um, I present it to the deanery asking for um, them to share with Catholic Women's League groups, um, with Knights of Columbus, uh, for us to go out and do a presentation that is ready to go. Unfortunately, we have not had one taker. So I'm glad that you're seeing that there's some interest. When you're out and about, I do ask trustees uh, to really encourage uh, your, uh, your parish communities to take advantage of our availability to go out and share that information in our parishes. That's three, Madam Chair. I just wanted to share with the trustees too that the, the consultants and itinerants have been working really hard with all our teachers uh, to deliberately infuse the social Catholic teaching into the curriculum. What we have been talking about is using different methods of sharing that information and doing different uh, learning designs for professional development. So we have evolved into developing webinars and e-modules such as the one that we just facilitated regarding the math evening which was highly successful. We are currently in the process of looking at developing other e-modules. We have developed, we've just completed developing some kindergarten modules to kind of educate not only our teachers and our principals and with the suggestion possibly we could actually facilitate that uh, for our parents as well to kind of explain to them what play-based learning is. In a similar vein then, we could most certainly explore a webinar or a, a, an e-module an e for our parents so we could facilitate them the same way. So I think it would be it's really insightful for parents to actually learn how we do infuse our social Catholic teachings into our curriculum. Good stuff, thank you, excellent. Any other questions on that topic? No, okay. Uh, then grades 
seven and grade 10 students. We had an 83% response rate, um, which gave us the results of over 10,000 students from our board and the public board combined. Um, as you know, that's part of our three-year monitoring cycle. We also do the early development instrument, uh, the kindergarten parent survey, uh, the Halton Youth Survey, and this year we also did a Halton Parent Survey, which went out to the parents of those same students in grades 7 and 10. Um, those results have just come back now, and we're in the process of analyzing those, and we had 1,800 parents respond to that. So we didn't have the same numbers that we had with the youth, um, but we do have some numbers to work with, and we're still looking at similar types of questions that were asked on the uh, youth survey. Um, the youth survey looks at things such as the social environment that kids live in, uh, questions around their community, uh, student engagement, peer connectedness, the bonding to school, um, and we do look at a number of developmental assets. Um, and some of that work is what um, Josie used at her school in moving um, developmental assets forward. Uh, the findings are used by a number of professionals across Halton um, to inform planning um, and to look at where the gaps are with our youth. So we use the, um, the results with respect to the work that we do and it supports our school improvement planning. It supports board improvement planning. We also use them as some of the indicators in our strategic priorities um, in terms of measuring and monitoring as we move forward. We've seen a number of data elements come forward through a number of monitoring reports um, that have come past this past year. Um, we also have been using a lot of the results from the, from the youth survey w when we educate parents. So, uh, for example, the last three years we've done presentations at the parent conference around developmental assets and around uh, the youth survey data. We have also recently now been going back to the students with the results of the data and getting their perspective on what do those data really mean and how would they see using that data. <coughs> so that's some work that we're um, continuing moving forward with as well. All of the data is made available um, through the, um, the Our Kids Network website in terms of the community level data. What we do um, in our board is we also produce school level results. So every school will get an individual customized profile of the data for their school. It will look at their school results in comparison to their families of school, in comparison to Halton Catholic. So they get a better perspective of where they sit situated in comparison to um, other schools within their family and where the board does generally. We also are making available more detailed results this time around that we weren't able to do in the past. They will be on a secure site for the schools only, but it will give them some gender breakdowns. It will also situate um, their schools within their neighborhoods as well, and we'll get um, a bit more detail to play with on that. Because a number of our schools do use their data to support their um, improvement planning, um, work that they're doing around safe schools, work that they're doing around um, bullying and harassment, um, and now looking at it with respect to um, mental well-being as well. In terms of some of the key findings, um, we do measure 20 developmental assets. Almost all of those assets have gone up between when we did the survey in 2009 and 2012. Um, that is the case for both grade sevens and grade 10 students. There is still a gap in that grade seven students achieve more assets and assets at a higher <coughs> level than do grade tens. So we're even with that same cohort of students, we are seeing a drop between grades 7 and 10. That's typical, but again, that is an area that we can um, look at working toward. Um, also, we also tend to find girls tend to report having higher assets than do boys. Other things that we find in the survey this time around is we have improvement in school safety. We have improvement in measures around family connectedness, and we have decreases in risk-taking behavior. So whether that's alcohol, tobacco, drug use, we're seeing reductions um, in all of those areas. I think collectively it says that we are doing a whole lot of good work, and we're starting to see um, the evidence of the work that we're doing. No, we can't align any of it to one particular initiative, but I think collectively the number of work that we've been doing and the types of work
work we're doing is actually paying off and i say that some of the work that we're doing is part of the our kids network that's extensive and there are many people who are involved with that from our board but also some of the work that we've been doing intentionally within our own board i think josie's presentation was example of that um there are several other schools that could come up here and do something similar um we've actually done a fair bit of work and i'll give credit to um rosanna bird uh barb o'connor and katherine stevenson who have done extensive work around developmental assets with our students and with our teaching staff and barb and katherine have also done some extensive work on aligning developmental assets with our catholic graduate expectations and that's been shared at um the parent conference it's also been shared with um at the professional development day and with um individual teachers so i think we are doing some good work moving forward and basically it's a good news story thank you any questions uh madam vice chair thank you through you to uh erica i'm really happy with the results because i can see that it's changing i guess my question is have the questions themselves changed like have you been able to target the questions so that you're getting more accurate results i guess the other question i'm wondering because of the drop in the substance abuse and that kind of surprises me because i know that you know kids in that age group are still doing a lot of things and i'm just wondering whether the way the question is posed does that sort of elicit a different response well that is interesting that's a it's an interesting example we do try to maintain the same questions some of them have been changed over time because we really didn't phrase it the right the right way the first time around and we weren't getting an accurate response moving forward some of the questions have changed because some of the measures have actually changed like um our uh, daily physical activity ministries changed the guidelines so our questions have to reflect the change in the guidelines the ones around um risk taking behaviors we have taken from um the uh, ontario uh, student drug use survey and the same measures that are used by uh camh the center for um, uh, mental health and addictions and they too are finding decreases provincially in some of those risk taking behaviors you a trustee rom thanks madam chair um just to uh, w- one area that you're looking at is um youth youth groups that, that that students are involved in and just generally speaking do you are you aware of um of uh, how widespread is like uh, the CYO in in Halton and and particularly like I'm thinking about groups that that don't require a lot of um registration money for for students are these things available um there are on a uniform basis some available we're not capturing that well yet throughout the survey because it very much is linked with resources and or availability of transportation to do a lot of that so we're not capturing that the way that we can some of that we capture more locally when we actually meet with smaller groups of young people and get insights that way but that is not a measure that we that's solid yet The next item is uh, the budget record. Budget report. I've got to put my glasses on. Budget report, uh, Superintendent Malone. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is the monthly budget report that we bring forward every month at the second uh, board meeting in each month. And um, currently, the uh, we're about halfway through uh, at the end of February, halfway through our fiscal year, and about 60% through the uh the school year and both the revenues and expenditures in the report appear to be in line with those percentages and with the previous year and uh myself or Stacy would be happy to answer any questions trustees may have any questions Mr. Rowe Madam Chair um uh, under the uh appendix B uh amounts received so the places where there's a uh, nil there is that just because it those specific grants like like first nations haven't come been delivered yet three madam chair uh, generally speaking that's correct um i'm looking at one in per- uh which one did, uh, s- sorry three madam chair on the is this on uh the um the revenue page um no um other provincial grants 
Oh, sorry, Appendix B. Yes, thanks. Yes, uh, that's correct. Um, th we The budget is set up in accordance with the funding we expect from the ministry, and so it would just be a timing difference that we haven't got it at that particular time. Uh, we, we usually uh, apply for the money, get the money, uh, and set up the budget to correspond to the amount of revenue, so there, it, it's a, a zero-sum Yes, uh, again, Madam Chair, this is our monthly report on the capital projects, which shows uh, ex expenditures on our, our uh, active capital projects as well as prior ones on, on, a, on a summary line basis. It shows our site costs and, and again, our debenture financing, um, which we get uh, ministry funding to help us with, at least uh, part of it. i um, be happy to answer any questions myself, Joffmo, or Stacy. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the two reports are for Alton Village and for Mil or, sorry, John Vanier, Catholic Secondary. Uh, Alton Village, we're uh, we're slightly behind schedule, and that's due to the, the poor weather conditions we've had. Unless you're a skier, but not good for construction. <laughs> uh, but we're hoping to make up uh, ground on that. And our John Vanier School, uh, we're moving very well. Uh, we've started some of the interior finishes on the third floor, third floor section. So once the good weather arrives uh, in April, uh, we'll be starting doing the exterior brickwork, and it'll look more like a finished building. Just on Loyola, I think I was driving past it the other day, and I think construction, like there, there were just people doing maybe uh, something on it. It could have been unrelated to the large things we've been doing, but what is the status on, is there anything going on? Uh, uh, excuse me, Madam Chair, Loyola will go through this commissioning or, or call that debugging a, a, of the building, and there's always deficiencies that haven't been done, so we'll bring them back to Subtrade to fish, fi fix deficiencies, or uh, particularly a mechanical system that hasn't been worked on, so it'll be an ongoing process throughout the year, because we still have a lot of warranty work to cover. And just to follow up, Madam Chair, um, through you, uh, but there hasn't been any like significant hiccup uh, with it compared to other building projects that we've uh, we've done. Uh, I would say not. Uh, it's typical that we have these sorts of things that occur in all our buildings. Uh, the uh, the way the way the construction is right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to a miscellaneous information 11.1, the uh, survey, the student survey. Uh, student trustees, do you have anything you'd like to add to Emily's comments pertaining to that? Jared? Um, just quickly, um, I, uh, I highly suggest all the trustees look through it. Um, if there's some snapshots um, on page like 74, I think 76 are where like the uh, percentages are. Um, kind of just gives you an idea of how what students, parents, and educators feel across the across the board, um, and kind of like another tool or resource um, that uh, you guys can utilize. Um, but yeah, it it took a lot a lot of effort. Um, over 10,000 students, uh, not to mention um, over probably 8,000 parents and multiple uh, educators did the survey. So um, they're pretty comprehensive and concise uh, results. So please. Look through them. They're really. It took a lot. Of, it, it was a lot of work, but uh, came through. Thank you, Jared. So, if you would like to take a look at that, and if you have any questions, perhaps you could direct them to our wonderful student trustees. Thank you. Eleven point two, the OCSTA resolutions uh, for the AGM, the upcoming AGM. Uh, they are very uh, clearly explained, starting on page one hundred and twelve. And there really isn't anything new. We are we are not new trustees now. We have a little bit of experience, and this is very much the same as uh, the last AGM. Uh, I don't know, Madam Vice Chair, if you wish to add anything to that. Or no, nothing really. I think, it's, I think most of it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, some of them will di obviously die on the floor, and some of them will go forward. Any questions uh, from trustees, Alison? Um, on resolution 7-13 on the, the payment and the fee payments that came in from London. Could you tell us the page number, please? Uh, 129. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm not, I'm not really sh sure what London hopes to gain from this. Like, they want to amend the formula. Like, you know, when you, when you look through it, when you look through all the things that OCSPA does, um, and how they expect OCSPA to operate under less money than they're doing now, um, I know it's to be received by the Office Management Committee, but I just don't understand how they expect OCSCA to do the work that they do when they're, if, if they're getting less money than they are now. Uh, I think that's a very good point, and maybe they have to look at the amount by which it would be reduced and what that would mean in terms of a decline in service. But I, th I think that could be an interesting discussion. I think that that's one that we should note to be prepared to ask the question mm -hmm. at the AGM. Thank you. Trustee Rowe. Uh, in regards to that, Madam Chair, well, I mean, if it makes the school boards feel better, if the fees um, are, are directly tied to their population, in a sense, if they were in declining enrollment, the fees can drop, um, the, but the actual levy can go up. Just, as you know, so they can increase it increase the levy so that you just end up with the same income for um, for uh, OCSDA. Okay, Hang so on. we will think on that uh, between now and the uh, date of the conference. Any other comments or questions pertaining to the, the uh, did you get all that down, Arlene? Good. Uh, so uh, we will take a look at that and certainly be there and uh, active in the discussions around that. If there's no other questions, we'll move on. We have no correspondence. We have no open questions. We do not have to go back into camera. We need a motion to excuse Ed, who I hope is doing well. Yesterday, Madam Chair. Yes. And uh, he didn't have a good day yesterday, but he's uh, he the physiotherapist comes into the house, and he's he's coming along. He uh, he does tend to overdo it, but that's that's what Ed does. Um, but he he's he's progressing. And uh, when he's ready to come back, then he'll he'll let me know, and I'll go get him. Thank you, Trustee Ramay. Uh, Trustee Murray, you made a motion to excuse Trustee Vienna. Thank you. A seconder, please. Trustee Danko, all in favor? Uh, thank you. Um, so now I guess we have adjournment and the closing prayer. So a motion to adjourn, please. Trustee Morrison, <laughs> followed by Trustee Rowe. All in favor? Sorry for laughing. Thank you. And. Director Pavlo is going to pray for us. Thank you. Um, I thought in honor of Pope Francis I, I would pray the prayer to St. Francis and, and then our newest uh, member of senior staff, uh, Mr. Cipriano, began this evening's meeting with that. <laughs> um, being quick on my feet, I thought, knowing that it was the Feast of St. Joseph, I would then Google and, and find the, the prayer uh, for St. Joseph. And of course, Adriana um, <laughs> contributed that. And so I would ask trustees to join me, please, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Son, 